figured it out. I figured it out from black and white. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out. I know it's a tough weekend. So, we're here to see Father uh, John Valdez talk about his magazine called Death to the World and the merchandise company that he runs. Uh, Father John's adolescence was entrenched in the Orange County punk scene before he became part of a Christian punk movement in the same area. In a tattoo shop where he and some friends held Bible study, he stumbled across the Orthodox Church and ultimately devoted his life to it. Among his first contacts in Orthodoxy were monks of the St. Herman of Alaska Brotherhood, as well as publishers of the punk-influenced Orthodox magazine, Death to the World. Father John was baptized with 30 others in 2006, and with the blessing from the St. Herman of Alaska Brotherhood Monastery, carries on the ministry of death to the world. In 2015, Father John, along with his wife and children, moved to St. Vladimir Seminary in New York City to pursue ordination to the priesthood. In 2016, he was ordained a deacon, and in, two, in June 2017, he was ordained a priest in the Antiochian Archdiocese. Along with his priestly duties, he continues to help with the ministry of uh, death to the world. Uh, so please join me in extending a warm welcome to Father. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, it's good to be here. I've never been in this part of the country before. I prepared a, um, a small talk, and after that, uh, we could have just some casual discussion. Reverend Father, Deacon, brothers and sisters, we have been struck by the divine arrow, and it is only the marksman, the one who draws us to him with love beyond nature, that our heart calls for. For it is in his embrace that a profound life of healing and mystery begins. It is in his embrace where we encounter a life of transformation, where the human person is ever transfigured into the likeness of his loving God, his fashioner and creator. It is in his embrace where we encounter life which begins out of this world, while yet remaining in it, to engage with the unseen and to participate intimately in something that before this life seems so distant or perhaps non-existent or out of one's grasp. It is in his embrace where, wandering the deserts of this world's riches, philosophies, and vain pursuits comes to an end before the cross, where our Savior's arms are wide and stretched open, and we see the truth not as an abstract idea, but as a person who is Jesus Christ. Today I would like to speak a little bit about how this profound life and embrace begins for some souls that perhaps live in the periphery of our missionary eye. Those people with shaved heads, mohawks, nose rings, and tattoos who are already unsatisfied with this world, seeking truth in a recognizably dying society, and above all, burdened by wounded hearts. In 1976, when the notorious punk band called the Sex Pistols cranked up distortion and hit London with all its vulgar fury, apocalypse was in the air. The city was suffering from the worst heat wave and drought that it had ever recorded. Crops were dying, Hyde Park was dead, and headlines were screaming out that the end was truly near. It is in this melee that punk made its first sensational debut in the music press, and it was fitting. Punk rock was built on the ashes of dead social movements, upon the graves of the beatniks and the hippie movement, but also on a recognizably dying society. It was a movement fueled and cross-pollinated by many subcultures, not necessarily birthed through music movements, but also through artistic fashions, political rants, mental health issues, and more. Rebellions of the past had failed, society had failed, and punk was there screaming what it thought to be the only reality, that there is no future. It became a favored son of nihilism, seeking to escape and change a world through shock value, loud noise, and violence. However, as dark and degrading as this scene would seem, it revealed a struggle for something that punk rock could only define through negation. It abhorred corrupt culture, materialistic lifestyles, social injustice, etc. It wanted and continues to want whatever is opposite of this world and all that its vanity and cheap tricks has to offer. Punk rock is a culture that seeks to dialogue with society a movement that ideally waves the banner of anti-consumerism and possesses a heightened aversion towards the world's corrupt influence on our lives. There is also an asceticism to it, an acknowledgement of poverty, mosh pitting to slogans like, in all our decadence people die, you are not what you own, 
or wealth is a ghetto. It is a rebellion of youth against a world that has failed them, a refuge to those who recognize the insidiousness of plastic suburbia and the mind-numbing death nail of the TV screen. However, in failing to recognize the rebellion and change that is necessary within the human heart, the false rebellion of punk rock collapses in on itself. It fails to satisfy, becoming just another dry desert, a false path that leads to dismay and destruction, and in the end, it is a culture with no future, becoming that monster it sought to ridicule, just another fashion show with its own celebrities, marketable products, and mundane mantras, a culture of depression, addiction, self-injury, hate, and suicide. This is probably best illustrated in the performances of bands that completely embrace the reality of punk's inherent nihilistic lifestyle and philosophical trajectory. It was only shortly after punk made headlines that bands like Broken Bones exposed the, the hopeless war cry of a generation that had nothing left. In terror through distortion, this band sang, no future, I don't care, what's the point of living, what's the point of anything, no feeling, what a nightmare, dead inside. Perhaps punk was taken to its fullest extreme in the career of the notorious Gigi Allen. A punk rock icon that proclaimed himself to be Christ, battered people on stage, and mutilated himself in front of fans. It is he who preached suicide as glamour and admirable, something one should do when they reach their peak. In him, stage performance became a twisted spiral of violence, self-mutilation, and crowds of young people flocked from abroad to watch it. In its initial fervor, the rebellion of punk rock sought to destroy and mock a corruption that it rightly identified in the world. Yet enslaved to the image of absurdity and degradation, it morphed precisely into what it despised. Like the prodigal son lying in the filth and slime among swine, so the subculture was and continues to be. However, in the early 90s, God pierced the dark clouds of the punk scene and allowed the rays of his love to enter and transformed a culture of nothingness into a stepping stone onto Golgotha and a means to embrace the cross and be united with the suffering God who hangs upon it. Escaping the burning flames of their subculture, a group of men flocked to an Orthodox monastery in Northern California and became monks, realizing where the rebellion and the war was to be waged within the human heart. This was because the God of suffering and of life spoke to their wounded hearts and pulled them into his loving embrace. They wrote shortly after this, we don't want a homogenized smiling American God who is merely the refuse of the rotting system around us. We have been raised on commercials and billboards. We don't want to be sold God in a silver wrapping paper and in a pink bow. We want to discover reality, not in an abstract way, which will make us feel good about ourselves, but a hard, grueling reality. We want truth, raw and real. We are desperate to know Christ crucified, not a plastic imitation of him. Only the man of sorrows can understand our sorrow, and only a God crucified and resurrected deserves our faith. Rebellion took on a whole new meaning, the rebellion against the flesh, the last true rebellion, because it unites one with God who is above the world. In an effort to bridge those still stuck in the darkness of subculture, the monks put together a zine, a cut and pasted publication done on a Xerox machine and passed around at underground shows and festivals. This black and white manifesto was like a voice calling out from the wilderness, inciting punks and all subculture creeds to abandon their false rebellion and embrace a life of asceticism, waging war in the heart. They named this manifesto Death to the World, after a quote from St. Isaac of Syria, which reads, the world is the general name for all the passions. When we wish to call the passions by a common name, we call them the world. But when we wish to distinguish them by their special names, we call them passions. The passions are the following, love of riches, desire for possession, bodily pleasure from which comes sexual passion, love of honor which gives rise to envy, lust for power, arrogance and pride of position, the craving to adorn oneself with luxurious clothes and vain ornaments, the itch for human glory, which is the source of rancor and resentment and physical fear. 
Where these passions cease to be active, there the world is dead. Someone has said of the saints that while alive they were dead, for though living in the flesh, they did not live for the flesh. See for which of these passions you are alive, then you will know how far you are alive to the world and how far you are dead to it. The manifesto also labeled itself as a zine to inspire truth-seeking and soul-searching amidst the modern age of nihilism and despair, promoting the ancient principles of the last true rebellion to be dead to the world and alive to the other world. The suffering heart that spurred one into the ranks of punk's false rebellion finds home and meaning in suffering, a redirection of rebellion into reconciliation with our Creator. Father Damascene, now the current abbot of the monastery and one of the monks who started this zine, wrote, These kids are sick of themselves, and they feel out of place in this world. We try to open to them the beauty of God's creation and invite them to put to death the passions, which is what we mean by the world. God takes despair and turns it around into something positive. Selfish passions can then be redirected into love for God, as Mary Magdalene did. We talk about the idea of suffering because that is what kids feel most strongly. We show that there can be meaning in suffering. Acknowledging the life of the scene they left behind and contrasting it with the monastic life, the life of asceticism and transformation in Christ, the writers of Death to the World open their third issue with these words. We are everything we once were, but now it is all changed. We still have no hope for paradise on earth, for we know that this world will end. Paradise is not on this earth, but in the hearts of the people who love God. We still feel pain. We still embrace it and do not turn away from it. But now that pain is transformed into something pure and beautiful by the agony of the cross, which conquers death. And the love we feel when we feel another's pain never dies. We still place no value on the superficial values of this world, youth, beauty, wealth, because all these will rot away. But now we don't have to go out of our way to make ourselves look ugly. We look the way God had made us and do nothing more about it. We still dig into ourselves and find filth, but now it is in order to eradicate it, to annihilate it, and thus prepare ourselves for the other world. We are still considered crazy by this world, which cannot understand our sanity. We strive to be honest to ourselves, not what our society, which is going to hell, tells us to be. We refuse to become slaves to history or fashion or public opinion or earthly institutions. We strive to be what we were intended to be, but now we know we are not mere animals, but have been created for eternity. And where are we going? To heaven, but not without sweat and blood, self-sacrifice, self-renunciation, and pain of heart, always remembering that, quote, the kingdom of heaven is taken by violence and the violent take it by force. Hatred and rebellion against this world become a hatred and rebellion against St. Isaac's definition of the world, that is, the passions. It is in rebellion that one is crucified with Christ and begins to bear the marks of the Lord Jesus in his body. This is where the life of these punks shifted to repentance, embrace that pain in one's own heart when he cries out like the prodigal son, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. In these words, one is not left without hope or no future, for this is when the heart is embraced by the Creator and adorned with a robe of grace. Rescued from the mire of a failing subculture and from feeding on the rusks of cheap promises, this is where punk rock can find its true rebellion. The distaste for corrupt, the craving for raw truth, the embrace of suffering, and what that one embodies in punk rock and other sub music subcultures is not for nothing. It is a truth and a pain of heart that is very sincere. However, it is directed outwards, which is only half of the battle. One must enter the battlefield of the heart and engage in warfare there. This is where Christ is, for he said, the kingdom of God is within you. Punk rock is right when it says that we should not be who the world dictates us to be. However, it is only through repentance that we come to the knowledge of our true person. It is right in that we should not become a slave to the world's materialism. However, we ought not to stop there, for being bound in slavery to the passions renders us like beasts, unable to look above where moth and rust do not destroy. 
It is right in that we ought to dialogue with the world about its absurdity and lack of fulfillment. However, it is not to mock, to be obscene, and to expose the decay of society without giving an answer, but to reveal the transformation in God's mystic embrace, the place where we become truly human. This is the last rebellion to die to this world. A zine in the, in the punk scene is a cut and pasted, this is actually the one they put together in the 90s. This is a, it's a cut and paste magazine that's put together and it's run off of a Xerox machine. The beauty about the zine in the punk rock scene is that kids can print these magazines cheaply and pass them out at shows and their friends can unstaple them and put them on a Xerox copper and pa copier and pass them out at shows and the thing circulates like crazy. So in the early 90s when these were put out, a lot of people actually flocked to the monastery because of this. There's a few people that were in really big bands in the underground scene in California, a band called Sleep, um, and some other bands where singers and other people from those bands went to the monastery, tried out the monastic life for a while, or converted to the church and helped print these early issues that were put out. Um, when I came in contact with Death of the World, it was in 2006, so it was about 12 years after they had printed and put together this one here. This was a catalyst for our conversion and the subse subsequent 30 people that I was baptized with. So even 12 years later, when it was kind of unearthed, it had a lot of impact on us who were entrenched in these scenes, yeah. So one thing that I didn't really mention in the talk that's actually very important to talk about within these subcultures is that with the growing divorce rate and the growing amount of alcoholism that is rampant in families and other kinds of substance abuse and broken homes, a lot of kids like myself found family there. So punk rock was not just something that you listened to on the radio, but every weekend or every time I got the chance to, I was at a show somewhere um, with people that I knew. So it became very tribal in a lot of ways. And these people became my family in a lot of ways. So that's something that really draws people into it. It's what, what drew me into it, was people that were sincere and were struggling with the same issues that you had and didn't think you're a weirdo. Didn't refuse to be like honest and upfront about being hurt and um, having pain of heart, right? Now, I was fortunate enough to be kind of drug out of the punk rock scene early on, the secular punk rock scene early on. I met some people in my high school that were involved in this like Christian punk rock scene, which pretty much paralleled everything that you would see in a secular scene, but these, these people were Christians and after show, they were all Protestants, and after shows, they would put down their electric guitars, plug in their acoustic guitars, and have like Protestant worship. And so this became my church. So. So it started off as a kind of family thing, and then became my church as well. And so this was all the time. Um, so I was kind of saved from the, the kind of the muck of the secular punk rock scene without God, without anything. Later on, those bands that I was really into that, that kind of made this Christian scene work moved away to different places or broke up or whatever. So a lot of us were kind of left abandoned without like family, without people to see every week. So we started going to secular shows and coming in contact with people at secular shows after, become, after being a Protestant Christian, these shows were just depressing, just very depressing. And people were really left with no hope and a lot of addiction, a lot of alcohol abuse. And um, these are kids that are on the fringe of society. Fortunately for myself and some of the friends that I had to replace this kind of like religious gathering that we went to with these Christian punk bands. We started a Bible study at a tattoo parlor. And after the tattoo parlor closed, we would study from night at night till four in the morning. And we would sit and talk. And But one of the things was that we were very, very dissatisfied 
with the Protestant churches that we went to on Sunday morning. Most of that was because what is inherent in punk rock is this want for the, for the raw and the real. And we felt like Protestantism was too fake and that Christianity wasn't radical enough. And so we wanted to find the Church of Acts, the Church of the Martyrs. And so we started looking through historical Christianity and ended up running into the Orthodox Church. And when we got in contact with these monks in, in Northern California, they sent us boxes of these um, issues that were already print out. So we started to read them and attend a local church near us. And that's how 30 of us were baptized and then 25 the next year. Being in that kind of culture of music and coming into the Orthodox music, what would you say about the effect of the music? It's a very popular question that I get asked in regards to music. A lot of people ask me about music when I, when I talk and um, are surprised when I say that punk rock music should not be listened to. And the reason why is because music incites the passions and it creates a flame within you. And that flame could either be a divine one or a not so divine one. I think the good way to talk about this is that we have to be very, very, very careful of what we feed ourselves and what we um, listen to because it definitely affects how we think, how we act. Um, it affects our emotions. And we have to be, the fathers tell us to be vigilant against the heart, right? St. Isaac also says to not acquire peace and to not give it up for anything in this world. And also, what is it if a man were to gain the whole world but lose his soul? So though punk rock and other music could um, be enticing to listen to, we also have to be very vigilant with our heart of what it does to us, how it affects us, how it affects our asceticism and our, um, our path towards God. Because if we struggle with sexual passion and we listen to music that talks about it all the time, then how exactly are we supposed to overcome that passion? Or if we have anger issues, but we listen to violent rock and roll all the time, how exactly are we supposed to cut those tumors, those cancerous things of our soul out of us and become more like Christ. And the music of the church does the exact opposite. While other music can inflame the passions, the music of the church is there to transfigure them and transfigure us into holiness. There's a real lack today of people just being real with other people and uh, being an open ear and able to just have a normal conversation with somebody, especially since we're so um, enslaved by our two inch by four inch screens of our phones. Interaction between people has become so impersonal and so fake that just to have a regular conversation with somebody about their day can uh, strike a remarkable um, thing in somebody's heart. And I mean, that's what I try to do when I encounter these people is that it's not about necessarily pushing for conversion in like maybe some of our Protestant um, people that we know would do, but it's just being real with them that maybe hopefully God would open up their eye to the, to the beauty of the church and the beauty of himself. Maybe it sounds like the cliche thing to say, but um, prayer. And sometimes we have to allow people to go through something until God sparks something in their heart. I mean, if somebody were to approach me when I was younger, if somebody tried to argue with me or to logically try to prove something to me about what I was listening to or what I was into, I would disregard that even more. And um, sometimes it just takes a fervent amount of prayer and waiting for God to ignite in the heart what is happening. Um, because the beautiful thing about um, when God ignites that in the heart is that he transforms everything that they're into that lead 
them away from him into something beautiful. Uh, like this, for instance, when these punk rockers became monks, there was, there was all this stuff from punk rock still left in them, but God used it towards an asceticism and um, a path towards him rather than something that cut them off from him. But one of the really sad things about these, about these subculture movements is they, they really present a false rebellion that if people were to see it, it's just the same thing as anything else. Punk rock likes to you know, flaunt itself as some sort of totally anti the system thing and its own thing and, and kids think that they're unique because of it, but it's just the same as anything else. When I was in punk rock, I, I hated on people who listen to rap music, but it was the same thing. It still doesn't reach the goal. That's what I experienced was straight up punk rock music, but with Christian and biblical lyrics. For two years, I was entrenched in this. And what was great about it is that it formed in me this sense that Christianity needs to be radical and something different from this world. If Christ said that his kingdom is not of this world, our Christianity should not look the same as the culture outside of it. So that was a really good thing for me to get from there, but it still did not touch on transformation, cutting off of the passions, an asceticism and a rebellion within one's own heart to be able to embrace God. And I would think that even if lyrics were to reflect these kinds of things, the music in and of itself, um, the pace of the music, the tempo of the music, all these kinds of things are drawn from, uh, are, are, they, they incite certain things within the, within the body. I mean, that's why, like with Father's question, church music incites something within us that is spiritual and different. Tempos and beats and, and the way that the, it's written. It's better than listening to secular punk rock, but it's still not getting to the the really the crux of the matter. Within this scene, there's so many different cases that it's really hard to pin down anything. I mean, I had friends that their parents were rich, but they were still dressing like they were poor punk rockers with shaved heads and mohawks. I had friends that were that had their families were very poor, but they dressed the same as the guy that was very rich, but he left his family to become part of the punk scene. There are people that are, were abused, so they come there. There's people that just don't like their family, so they come there. It's hard to really pin down exactly what it is, but I will say that my generation, for instance, that was raised in front of a TV screen and had a separated family and both parents working without anybody at home really to raised me all the time. There was no sense of like family unit. My dad's house that I went to at some, uh, on some weekends, my mom's house that I stayed at most of the time, but there was something kind of like, I don't know, missing from it. And I got really sick and tired of a television screen telling me what to do with my life. I mean, it was a babysitter. The 80s and early 90s, like television was your babysitter. A lot of these kids are just displeased with their family life and don't really have a very, very strong connection with their parents. The parents don't take the time sometimes to really see what's going on. I think we have a huge advantage in the church in that we are supposed to cultivate, we should cultivate a church with our, within our own homes. And that prayer together every night and trying to have dinner together every night is something that is monumental to keeping our families intact and in the church. It's something that I try to practice with my family because I didn't have that growing up. Family dinner together is not sitting down with a TV tray and watching TV together. It's not about everybody sitting on their own phones and looking at their screen and being incredibly entrenched in fake life. We have these tools in the church and a lot of writings from holy people in the church that direct us to raise our kids like we have our own little church at home. And I think this is really a beautiful thing. I mean, sometimes this is not, it doesn't always pan out perfect. People leave and they come back. Maybe people leave for a really long time and they come back. But a very beautiful thing that I like to remind people is that in the stories of the Desert Fathers, there's so many stories of a monk leaving the monastery. And he takes off his cassock, he takes off everything, and he decides to live in the world. 
Some of these stories might even go into he gets married and has children and his wife dies and all this kind of stuff he goes through and he ends up coming back to the monastery. We don't know exactly how long these monks were gone from the monastery. It could be 40 years, it could be 50 years, who knows? But then they come back. You know, there's always hope that somebody will come back. And our prayer is that they will come back, you know. But it's cultivating a structure of the church within the house keeps people from falling to the wayside. The reason why punk rock and these subcultures reject religion and sometimes totally say really crude and um, distasteful things about it um, is because, or they do it um, for good reasons, because they look at Protestantism and they see fakeness. Um, they see a religion that's just like this world. They look at you know, other parts of other faiths and would say the same thing. Interestingly, there's a lot of movements within uh, punk rock, particularly in the 90s, that um, embrace Buddhism, Hare Krishna uh, movements and things like that. And the reasons why is because within them there's some kind of asceticism, there's some kind of rebellion against the world, which is not really practiced or talked about in really other sects of Christianity besides the the true church. Um, asceticism in the Catholic Church is not really uh, focused on very often, at least in the where where I come from, the Catholic Church is around where I come from in California. But we have something to offer in Orthodoxy to these people in that it's not just a religion that's fake to control people, because that's the that's the big kind of thing, right? But it's a way of life and any kind of rebellion that you're really into and you think that you're rebelling against the world is nothing in comparison to the lives of some of these saints that we have. And that's a very beautiful thing to be able to make a bridge with. It's beautiful to have these bridges, you know. You, if you have people that have parents that neglected them or kick them out onto the street or whatever. I and mean, there's lives of certain saints, like Saint Theophil of the Key of Caves. His mom thought he was a strange baby, so she tried to drown him like three times. And God saved him, and he, and he was raised and went to the monastery and became this great saint. So there's beautiful things that we have in our tradition that link um, the pain that people feel to um, real people in the church. And so it becomes not just a religion with all these structures and traditions and et cetera, et cetera, but it becomes a religion that, um, that really heals and speaks to whatever is going on inside. When Father Seraphim Rose, the monk who started the monastery in Northern California that the zine came from, gave a talk in the early 80s, he said that it would be very hard for people within the rock and roll culture to convert to orthodoxy. And when I first converted, I loved Father Seraphim Rose. He was the catalyst for my conversion, but at the same time, I really didn't like those words. And it took me quite a few years to understand what he, what he meant because he's right. It's very hard to convert from the subcultures because there's a huge part of, um, like myself when I first converted, there's a huge part of me that still just really wanted to project all of even orthodox values outward. Like the world is wrong because it is not following the orthodox path. But it took me a while to realize that that really um, is secondary to saying, well, I'm not really following the Orthodox path. And I think there's something really beautiful in St. Seraphim Masarov's words, where, um, paraphrasing, that we have, to, we have to change ourselves and we have to acquire peace first before we can give it to other people. You know, We can't give something unless we have it. So as far as bringing the church outside of these walls, it starts first with us transforming before going to try to give the message of transformation or a transformation to another person. So as far as changing the world, that's what we have to offer. I mean, we have a very, very beautiful um, tradition of the way that we look at um, mankind and the value that we give to the human person and the beautiful depth that is recorded in the writings of the fathers about what the human person is, how, how the human person functions, 
what, how the human person functioned at, at creation, how he functions now after the fall, how Christ heals that. There's so many beautiful things that we have in the church. And a lot of the fathers and the canons of the church are described as surgeons or, or physicians that know exactly where to cut, where to take tumors out, where to take, where to cure somebody, how much medicine to give to somebody or not to give to somebody. So we have all these very, very beautiful healing aspects of the church. And in order to give them to the people outside of the church, uh, we really need to live them authentically all the time. And that's not to say that we're going to all be saints tomorrow. And that's not to say you shouldn't tell anybody about the gospel until you have a glowing halo around your head. Um, but that's something that we need to work, work for because there is so much fakeness out there. There is so much fakeness. Like nobody needs another Christian walking up to them, trying to tell them about their church when like they're not authentic about their own faith. Nobody needs that. Uh, people um, are done with it. I mean, it's, it's just the same story over and over again. When we, when we start to live orthodoxy, truly orthodox, and I don't even think that we should be calling ourselves orthodox if we're not living the faith because it's not about something that we believe, but it's about a life that we live. If we're not living those things, nobody is going to care. Nobody's going to care. So first we need to live it before we can give it. We need to approach people where they're at, wherever in their lives. And sometimes somebody looks like they're doing really well and that God has blessed them with a lot of things and are suffering on the inside. Sometimes people are sitting in the gutter in the street and dirty and haven't taken a shower in, in nine days. But sometimes they'll teach me more about um, how to live peacefully and humbly than I can teach them. It's just about approaching people or receiving people, I guess, would be a better word, wherever they're at in their life. I mean, everybody is different on the inside, right? Part of approaching people for, from where they're at is kind of getting to know who they are and knowing their circumstances. In that particular instance, there could be so many different things that are is going on inside of a person, whether that be complete hopelessness, God's not going to save me, I'm going to hell, or complete just flippant, I don't care, God's just not going to save me, I'm going to be in hell anyways. And there's not really any um, desire to change that or to even... They don't even really acknowledge the gravity of what they're saying or, you know, um, that hell even exists, you know. So there's so many different things. People we don't know outside of the church, even people that we know in the church, it's very important just to be patient with them and try to live as authentically as we can so that they might see something else or they might see something in the church that, you know, spark. We have to pray that God would ignite something in them. There's um, a subdeacon in Washington, Joseph Magnus. He actually printed um, his life in one of the issues, and it's a really beautiful story. He um, went from subculture kind of stuff into Eastern religions, and he went to India, and he lived at ashrams, which are Hindu, Hindu monasteries, and he retreated into a cave in the Himalayas, and, <laughs> and he met Christ there. And so there's this, he, he's a very, very good, good guy to talk about the, the difference between false spirituality and true spirituality.